Hello everyone, my name is Beata Kenik from Viga Foundation from Poland. This is the Women in Science series and today I have a huge pleasure to talk with Professor Lalita Ramakrishnan, an outstanding microbiologist, immunologist and physician. Professor Ramakrishnan received her medical degree from the Baroda Medical College in India and her PhD in immunology uh, from uh, the Tufts University in Boston. Since uh, 2014, she has worked at the University of Cambridge as professor of immunology and infectious uh, diseases. Uh, hello, professor. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. You have made huge uh, contributions to the understanding of the biological uh, mechanisms of tuberculosis. Uh, and so, first of all, I would like to ask you about this disease and your research related to it. I must um, admit that as a non-expert, when I hear tuberculosis, I, have, um, I associate it with historical accounts, with historical times, earlier times, like the 18th or 19th centuries. And as far as uh, the second half of the 20th century and the 21st century so far, one might think um, this has not been a major threat to public health. Uh, of course, as it turns out, this is not true. So uh, my first question is, do many people all over the world suffer from tuberculosis nowadays? So that's a, thank you very much for inviting me. And that is a very good question. And it's actually a question I get asked a lot. If I, you know, if I'm sitting next to someone on a, an airplane or a train, and I, they, I say I work on TB, they say, oh, is this, do we still have TB? I thought that was gone. And, and it is true. So, you know, TB is the single largest infectious killer of humanity. It's estimated to have killed 1 billion people so far. For a little bit of perspective, smallpox, you know, which we all associate with being a major killer, is estimated to have killed about a third as many people, about 300 million. Influenza, with all its pandemics, has killed about 50 to 100 million. HIV AIDS, 36 million, so one thirtieth. COVID-19, 6 million. And the, part of the reason is that TB is a very old disease. It's been there, you know, for millennia and certainly has been a major killer of infectious killer of humanity all, you know, all through the Middle Ages going into the, the, the early 20th century. Um, in the 18th and 19th centuries, it was responsible for fully half the mortality of the working age group of people in Europe. So 25 the age 25 to 40, can you imagine a half of these people were dying of TB? The sad thing is that, you know, now 60 years after we've had more than 60 years after we've had an effective treatment regimen. Yes, it's a complicated regimen, um, but it is an effective regimen. TB remains one of the leading causes of death. It, it is still rates about uh, uh, it, it still rates about, uh, it ranks at about number 13 or so of all, all cause mortality. Uh, and it is second only to COVID-19. Until 2020, it was the leading cause of mortality. So it kills about a million and a half people every year now, right now. Uh, and it causes disease and suffering to about 10 million. Just as before, many of these it, it disproportionately affects young people. And for example, in fact, it, about a million of the sufferers of TB per year are children. So while it's not as prevalent in Europe, it's very, very much a disease that has remained in the rest of the world. Yes, this is uh, really interesting and, uh, and for sure, maybe a little surprising and shocking. Um, and please tell me what causes the disease? Yeah, so TB is caused by a bacterium. So unlike COVID-19, which is caused by a virus, TB is caused by a bacterium 
that is a bit of a special bacterium in that it's got a very complicated uh, outer 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 layer, shall we say? And this, uh, and it's got complicated proteins and lipids or fats on it that makes it quite impervious to immune defenses. And so it, it, it allows the bacterium to withstand immune defenses, not all of the time, but enough of the time to cause disease in that number of people, in a great number of people. Um, and, you know, it's, the, it is, it is, so it's always transmitted through aerosol, which will, you know, resonate in this modern era because COVID has made all this very popular again, but TB is spread through aerosols and it basically goes down into the lung and that's where the disease process starts. Um, the, the, but there are a few nuances to this. First of all, uh, TB is mostly a lung disease, but it can also go to other parts of the of the body and and cause disease in in just about every single part of the body. And a particularly dangerous place that it can give you disease is in the in the lining of the brain or the brain itself. It's called TB. It can cause what is called meningitis. And this is a can be a very lethal disease. You know, it can be can carry a mortality of 20 to 40 percent even today, even if you give the treatment and the the, the treatment is efficacious, uh, it, it's still associated with a very high mortality. I think uh, since, you know, I think one important point that that should be made is that a, a lot, while, you know, drug sensitive TB is pretty amenable to treatment. It, you, you can cure it if you treat with three to four drugs for about six months. This is far from ideal uh, because this, is, this, this causes a big problem in eliminating disease worldwide. But nevertheless, it is treatable. But, part, but, but a big problem that has, that has happened over the last decades is that there are now drug resistance strains, what we call multi-drug resistance strains that have become resistant to the first line um, uh, treatments. And this is called, you know, MDR for multi-drug resistant TB, or if it becomes resistant to more and more drugs, at some point it starts to be called extensively drug resistant TB or XDR TB. And this is a particularly dangerous illness. And the part, the reason I wanna highlight this is that while TB is, you know, not that common in Europe, like only about 3% of the global uh, burden of TB is in Europe. However, MDR or resistant TB is disproportionately common in Europe. So about approximately 25% of the global M resistant TB is in Europe. And most of this is in Eastern Europe. So, for example, the Russian Federation and mm -hmm. Ukraine, which are uh, two countries very much on our minds these days, yes. have had a troubling burden of, of increase in, in drug-resistant TB. And this drug-resistant TB is, is transmissible. So if I have drug-resistant TB and I don't get treatment, which is often the case because you initially just get started on the treatment for sensitive TB, and it's not really treating my TB, I can transmit it to people around me. And so it is actually a great worry right at this moment with the, um, with the, the, the political and social turmoil in, 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 in much of East, in Eastern Europe right now, and the, uh, the humanitarian crisis and displacement that one of the many, what, you know, from, from my point of view, uh, one other uh, ramification of this is going is very possibly going to be a further increase in drug resistant TB. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that in in um, in two thousand and one, you joined uh, the University of uh, Washington, where you pioneered the study of tuberculosis and zebrafish. Uh, why zebrafish? Yes. So, you know, 
I need to go back just a step to so that people can understand this. My first decision was when I became a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford and I wanted to study TV. And I went to this guy uh, uh, called Stanley Falco, who was a, he's arguably the father of modern bacterial pathogenesis. And by pathogenesis, it simply means how do bacteria cause disease? And he had studied this for many, many human pathogens. And for example, uh, the uh, cause of, um, of typhoid fever, of whooping cough, of helico, you know, of gastric ulcers. And I'd said, well, can I study, I'd like to come and study TB in, in your lab. And he had suggested to me that I look for a surrogate um, organism that wasn't human TB itself, but was something closely related to human TB uh, that I could then study in an animal model. Because there are not, there are, there are animal models for human TB, but the more commonly used ones like mouse don't faithfully reproduce uh, the disease. And then the, the more the, the, uh, the, the other ones used are non-human primates. And, you know, you can see that they have lots of difficulties, both cost and ethical. And so the idea was, the idea that we came up with was, can we find a, an organism that's close to the human bacterium in, in its genetic and disease causing a platform and and then use that with a with its natural host so i came up with something called mycobacterium marinum this turns out you know we got really lucky because it turns out when we you know finally got sequencing and so on that it's the closest relative to the human tb bacterium but it causes disease in cold blooded animals and it causes disease in cold blooded animals because its growth temperature is lower and our core body temperature tends to be higher, whereas cold-blooded animals have a lower temperature because they adapt to the environmental temperature. So, you know, it's known to cause disease in fish, frogs, etc. And so, so when I was a postdoc, I started to work with this organism and I had long decided that I was going to try to work with zebrafish. And I only got to doing that when I got to the, got my own lab and my own job at the University of Washington after finishing my postdoc. Now, that, that brings us to the question, why zebrafish? Zebrafish are wonderful little fish. They're, they're, they're small little fish that come from the, the river Ganga or the Ganges as the English call them in, in, the, you know, in, in Northeastern India and Bangladesh. And they are, uh, they, they are loved by home aquarium uh, tank owners because they're very easy to grow and, you know, it's very hard, they're hard to kill. And uh, what, but the beautiful thing about the zebrafish is that it has a, a lar embryonic and larval phase that's, that during which it's transparent. So it's transparent for about two to three weeks of its life. And so you can take these larvae and infect them, and you can uh, you can follow infection in live animals. You can put the whole little animal, you know, it's like a little sago bean, and you can put it under the microscope, and you can follow what's going on. And the zebrafish for this property had been discovered long before I came to the scene, and this is why we thought to do it. They have been identified by people who like to study how the body develops, which is something of great intrigue. How does our heart form? How do our eyes form? You know, etc. And and people use all different organisms to to look at all different models to look at this. And someone had said, well, you know, if we can look in the zebrafish, we can watch everything happen live. And then on top of that. The zebrafish are amenable to genetics, so you can make genetic mutations in them fairly easy, relatively easily. So you can also make mutations and say, okay, does my mutation change how the heart develops? Oh, wait a minute. If I mutate this fault, the gene X, now my the heart is not making, not forming properly. And you so you know you can also get to the genetics of development. And this is what it was being used for. When, when we decided, well, why don't we think, why don't we look to see if you can use it to study 
uh, infections. And so what we did was we just infected them with bacteria that were had become that we had rendered fluorescent by putting in genetically engineering the bacteria to become fluorescent so we could watch them. And, and also genetically engineering various cells of the fish to make them fluorescent of different colors. So, you know, we could have this little multicolor scheme and watch infection happen. And this was the idea we had. And it took off very quickly, but I had a couple students that got enthusiastic and it took off very quickly. And that's how we uh, decided to, that those are the reasons that we started to use the fish. It's fascinating. And when I was reading about your research, I came across uh, um, a, a word, a term, which may be very useful even to non-experts in order for, for the understanding of what we are going to, what we are talking about. What are macrophages? Yes. So macrophages are, are very early defense cells of the immune system. So the immune system puts out a whole, it's got a whole array of different cells and a whole array of different proteins and even some different kinds of fats that we call them lipids that can mediate immune defenses. And so, but some of the very early cell types that we think about are neutrophils and macrophages. Neutrophils are very early, you know, cells that go to fight infection. So for example, when you have a boil and you have pus, the pus is nothing but neutrophils that have eaten bacteria and killed them. You know, usually say Staphylococcus aureus is the, you know, what we call staph. And that, that, you know, that's, and it's that little gamish or mass of dead, of neutrophils and bugs that, are, that cause a boil or cause pus. But the other major, major line first, major first line defender is the macrophage. The macrophage is slightly more subtle. It's actually one of the, it is even earlier than the neutrophil to get to places. And I like to think of it as a little bit of a calmer cell, but it also picks up bacteria and kills them. So it can also, it also participates and certain kinds of bacteria, it's the front line. It for, for many reasons, it turns out to be the most important cell and TB is one of them. So if a TB bacteria infects, the first thing that goes to it is a, a macrophage. And in fact, much of the time, the macrophage kills the bug and that's the end of the game. We just never find out about those things because those people don't get infected, right? We only see the tip of the iceberg with the people that 10 million. The 10 million is the tip of the iceberg, but it, our estimate from various epidemiological studies is that about 90 to 95% of people clear TB at, what, at various steps of that early infection. So that is a long-winded way of telling you what a macrophage is. It's an early first-line defense cell that importantly moves and gets to where the bacteria are and, 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 and can kill them. The macrophages you. also have a very, very important second role, completely independent of their mm -hmm. role in infection. Uh, they are very much involved in, uh, in being the sort of scavengers of the bodies, dying cells. So we get a lot, a lot of cell death has to happen during, inf uh, during development. And macrophages go and clean up messes and clean up dying cells also by just eating them. So they eat anything bacteria, debris, and so they also can prevent inflammation, uh, they can keep development going properly, and they have a role in infection. And please tell me, why did you take up um, research in this field? Why did you decide at some point to study tuberculosis? Yeah, so, you know, look, I grew up in India where there was a lot of TB and sadly, India is still the world's leader in the greatest number of cases of TB. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, my, when I was a kid, my mom had TB. She had, she had three bouts of spinal TB. At the time it's, I wasn't that interested in TB or medicine or science or anything like that, but undoubtedly it must have had some influence. 
And then I, when I went to medical school, you know, TB was very, was just rampant. I mean, you know, we would admit people and then we would screen them at the end of the admission day and find all the people with TB and separate them. And there were always many people with TB, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so TB was very much on my mind. Um, but of course I came up about, I, I, I had no particular decision to, to study TB. I had become a medic and then at some point decided to also combine it with science. And so I, you know, gone and got a PhD in immunology. And then I've gone back to medicine to do my medical residency training and my fellowship training. And, you know, initially when I was trying to choose a fellowship, I was actually going to, I was pretty much set to go and do hematology and oncology, you know, just cancer, cancer, mm -hmm. cancer uh, specialty. But I don't know, it somehow, you know, Towards the end of my training, I switched and decided that, no, actually, I was fascinated by infectious diseases. And even then, so then I went, decided to do a fellowship in infectious diseases at UCSF, University of California, San Francisco. And even then, I was mainly uh, thinking about studying hepatitis B virus. And then somehow, I read an article by, this, by my postdoc mentor, Stan Falco, about intracellular pathogens, because most bacteria don't live inside cells. You know, they, they attack you from outside the cell and, uh, and cause disease. But there are some pathogens like the typhoid bacterium, for example, mm -hmm. uh, even the plague bacterium, these can live inside cells. And that's a whole, uh, you know, art form. How do you live inside a macrophage that is designed to kill you? The, you know, how does the TB bacterium know how to deal with the defenses of the very cell that is intended to kill bacteria? And Stanley had little written a review about this. It had nothing to do with TB, but it was about intracellular bacteria. And mm -hmm. I read this small, it was a mini review in, cell, in a journal called Cell, and I still remember it clearly. And I thought, this is fascinating. And I was thinking, well, maybe I can combine my interest in TB, which is a very important problem with really cool biology, which is how do intracellular pathogens live? Because I knew that TB was an intracellular pathogen. So I went to Stanley and talked to him. And then that's how we came to the, let's study Mycobacterium marinum. So that's how I got into TB. And um, another devastating disease, uh, which you deal with uh, in your research is leprosy, right? Yeah. Uh, Please tell me a little bit more about your studies of yeah. this mechanism. Yeah, so you know, um, most of the work in our lab has been about TB and about TB meaning TB pathogenesis. And by pathogenesis, again, the word simply means uh, the process of disease causation or the actually rather the mechanism of disease causation. And so we've, you know, we've studied for example, in our lab, we've studied, you know, most of my lab studies, the because we can watch TB pathogenesis from the very beginning, we can say, okay, how does the bug get into macrophages? How does it manage to survive in the macrophage? And then um, if it does survive, a very interesting phenomenon happens where um, it takes the macrophage, brings the bacterium inside, you know, deep inside our body. So instead of, if it doesn't manage to kill it, it paradoxically brings the, the bacterium in so that now the bacterium is within us. It's crossed the, you know, the, the barrier in the lung and is within the lung tissue, for example. And then there, what happens is that new macrophages come and you form this, and what forms is a tight collection of macrophages called the tubercle or the granuloma. And within this, the, this tubercle can sometimes kill the bacteria. Now, you know, even if the first macrophage couldn't, now this collection can, but many times they can't. And the, macro, the bacteria get the upper hand and then they cause uh, these macrophages to die. And, you know, they get released from them and that's how they transmit to the new host. And so our lab has really been working on every step of this. How do we 
Uh, how does the bacterium cause disease at each of these steps? And importantly, once we learn those steps in, in excruciating detail or in fine detail, can we now start to identify drugs, you know, unexpected drugs that could that could cure uh, cure this infection? And indeed, we've actually identified multiple drugs. One is in clinical trials. Others, we hope, will get into clinical trials. Mm -hmm. So, you know, on this backdrop, I had a postdoc come to my lab from Harvard, uh, Cressida Madigan, and we talked about this. And I had always been interested in the question of leprosy. The leprosy is super interesting because it has it also involves the macrophage. It also forms these granulomas, and yet it has a unique feature that is devastating, which is that it causes nerve disease. And I think all of us who've read old books, old novels, we know that you know we associated with these you know fingers falling off, you know your face is disfigured, you can go blind. And all this is because it damages the nerves and specifically what are called the peripheral nerves, the nerves close to the skin. And the zebrafish, because it's, as I told you, developmental biologists like it. Well, one of the groups of developmental biologists who like it are people who study how nerves, how the nervous system. Uh -huh. uh, Sorry, Dr. Sharma. So, uh, I, please, uh, Professor, uh, could you please uh, uh, repeat the last sentence? Because there was yes. a moment when there was yes. uh, an uh, yes. So uh, an I'll, 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 uh, yeah, I'll get to the uh, so so you know leprosy obviously damages nerves, and the zebrafish is a great tool to study um, nerves. Developmental biologists have been using the zebrafish to study the nervous system. So we thought we thought well, why don't we combine the strength of the zebrafish uh, with uh, in, in, in the ability to study how nerves look? Because you can actually, you can visualize nerves in the fish. And, you, and we said, let's see if we can, call, we, can, we can study leprosy. And so we were delighted to find, uh, and as I said, this is all the work of one postdoc, we were delighted to find that, um, uh, you could see nerve damage in the fish. We could literally see the peripheral nerves being damaged. Uh, actually, it wasn't the peripheral nerves. I take it back. It was it was a central nerve, but regardless, it was where the bacteria were, and we could find that the the nerve was damaged, and it and in and the nerve damage looked identical to what human nerve damage looked like. You know, and we could even do electron microscopy and we could look and we could compare it. And you basically saw the exact same pattern. So this was now, now we knew that we were on the right track. And so the question was, how does it do it? And there's been a, there's been a, people had the idea that the reason it did it was that a very specific uh, surface lipid, or as I said, a lipid is a fat called mm -hmm. phenolic glycolipid one, or PGL1 uh, directly went and damage directly caused nerve damage, and this was that you know the bacteria get into the nerves and this this PGL1 from the bacterium, which is really pretty much found only in the leprosy bacterium, uh, that this causes uh, the nerve damage. And what and so what when but when Cressida looked she found that no, actually, it wasn't the bacteria directly that caused the damage. It was the macrophages that caused the damage. So like the TB bacterium, the leprosy bacterium also infects macrophages. Now it turns out, remember I told you that macrophages had this other function as well, that they have to go about and clean up the you know, debris that form all the time in our body. So they're kind of the, the scavengers, the cleaners of the body. And so what typically happens is that bacteria go and they kind of patrol nerves. You know, they wander around and they're on the nerves. And as you know, there's, the, there's a sheath on the nerve called the myelin sheath. And this is very important for conduction in the nerve. And um, the, uh, they clean up any bits of myelin that are, you know, 
they keep it all nice and tidy, put it that way. Now, it turns out that when the bacteria are infected, they still patrol the nerve because they're still trying to do their work, mm -hmm. even though they've got the bacteria in them. But the bacteria induce the, the macrophage to make a, um, a compound. It's called inducible, it's called nitric oxide. So they induce a gene and the gene causes this nitric oxide to be formed in the macrophage. I mean, it's always got a little bit, but it causes an excess. So as the nerve is patrolling, this nitric oxide, sorry, as the macrophage is patrolling, the nitric oxide is very diffusible and in large quantities can be quite damaging. So it goes, it diffuses out of the macrophage into the nerve. Just as it's moving along the nerve, it goes into the nerve and it goes and damages a specific organelle in the nerve called the mitochondrion, which is, you know, the, the energy producing uh, organelle of the cell. We call it, it's known as the powerhouse of the cell. So it goes and causes damage to that. And if you damage the mitochondrion of any cell, you're going to kill that cell. And that's how it causes nerve damage. And so it was, we discovered a completely new mechanism. But what was really interesting was that this idea that macrophages inducing having excess of nitric oxide that then damages the mitochondria of nerves has been associated recently with inflammatory nerve diseases. Most important of this mm -hmm. is, is multiple sclerosis. And so that's how they, they, that is supposed to be one of the mechanisms by which multiple sclerosis happens. And so in identifying the same kind of mechanism in leprosy, we've now taken it into the range, into the realm of inflammatory nerve diseases, you see. And once you get there, you can now start to think about treatments that, you know, maybe some of the treatments used in these inflammatory nerve diseases down the road could be used in leprosy. It's fascinating. Uh, Professor Ramakrishnan, um, let me move a, a little again, I'm sorry. Oh, now it's much better. Um, now I would like, if you, if I may, I would like to ask you um, a more personal question uh, because I'm always curious. Uh, how did you become interested in science? I know, of course, you come from a family of scientists, but perhaps there was uh, someone who had a particular influence. Yeah, you know, I get asked that, and the answer is a little bit boring. So I when I mean, yes, I came from my my parents were both scientists and my older brother was from the beginning, very interested in science at the time. He was very mm -hmm. interested in physics. And um, I, um, as a as a, you know, growing up and as a child and, 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 and into my teens was I was good at science, but, you know, particularly math and uh, math and physics and you know, so they were not problems for me and I was good at them and they came to me relatively easily. But I wasn't fascinated by them the way I know many people who have become scientists are. I mean, you know, they didn't they didn't really grab me. They were just sort of fun and easy. Um, and so, you know, when when the time came to decide and in India, you've got to decide, you know, when you're you know just finishing high school, um, I was sort of thinking, well, what should I do? And then I sort of, and then I decided to go to medical college. And I almost, it's almost, you know, I like to joke that if you're sort of, you're sort of good at every, you know, you're good, you're reasonably good at things, but not particularly gifted in anything. Well, you know, medicine's an obvious choice. You could go do it. And of course, this made my dad very happy because, you know, he wanted at least one of his kids to go into medicine. So I was the last remaining target. So, you know, he was, uh, he was, you know, super pleased. But then when I went to medical college, you know, this is medical college in India. First of all, you know, it was a poor hospital and you saw a lot of suffering. And because of economic uh, difficulties, you know, you couldn't help many people. You, I mean, you of course, helped so many people, but you also didn't help many people. And I felt very dissatisfied with, um, you know, not understanding disease and so on. And why, you know, what's the, again, that word pathogenesis, you know, what, and I think in a way it was almost the discontent with the state of medicine 
that probably drew me to science more than the more standard routes that you might have thought from my my upbringing and my background. So, you know, I had to come to it from a point of not liking medicine. And then I decided to still go ahead and finish medicine. And then I applied for PhDs and I went and did a PhD in immunology and um, at, at Tufts University, as you pointed out. And I had a fantastic graduate mentor, Naomi Rosenberg. And she was a, you know, a, a very good scientist. And I loved the way she thought about problems. And, and I think that kind of cemented my, my, my interest in science, which then really, uh, you know, took off uh, after hiatus, you know, when, you know, so then when I went to do my residency and so on, it was very much with this sort of scientists, um, you know, mind and so on. And, and, and so I, even though I had a four year hiatus, I was still thinking along the lines of scientists. And then of course, when I went to Stan Falco's lab, you know, another great scientific and personal role model. And then, you know, I got interested in that. But, but I should say that, you know, at some level, I feel like I'm more of a puzzle solver, or I think of myself more as a puzzle solver or a sleuth than as a very broad scientist. Like, you know, I sort of take on a, a, a there's a question that comes to my, you know, it becomes very obvious to me. And then I try to solve that question, you know, uh, you know, trying to grab things from everywhere, quickly learning things. And it, it, and it is a particular brand of science, you know. So I guess I'm sort of not even sure if I'm a scientist or a physician who's interested in, uh, you know, the science of disease. Mm, Professor Ramakrishnan, thank you so much for joining me, for uh, for talking with me, for your fascinating presentation, for for sharing your knowledge uh, with me today. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure and an honor. Great. Thank you so much.